Good afternoon, dear friends. Thank you very much to, uh, for coming here. Today we have a lucky opportunity and a privilege uh, to host Pavel Ivlev here. Pavel Ivlev is a prominent lawyer from Russia. He worked for Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the most fam famous political prisoner uh, of Russia, who was pardoned by President Vladimir Putin shortly before the New Year. Pavel Ivlev is a dear friend and colleague. We used to work together in uh, the first privately owned law firm in Moscow in 1992. He is a graduate of the law school of the Moscow State University, a great lawyer, a great person, and I'm absolutely sure that you will enjoy his presentation. Also, there is a small amount announcement for the students that there will be another er event on Friday at 10 a.m. It will be a live conference with the University of Lviv in Ukraine. You know that the the events are moving forward rampantly in Ukraine, so it promises to be very, unfortunately, it will be more interesting in, that we could expect it. So thank you very much, and let's welcome Pavel. Pavel, please come in here. Okay. Um, hey, everybody. Um, and thank you. Um, First of all, uh, thank you for inviting me here. Thank you to University of Michigan, and uh, it's really a privilege to uh, to speak with speak here. Uh, do you hear me well? Is it okay? Did it, did it turn? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so, starting from the freezing temperature and a lot of snow in the streets, uh, there are, you can see many similarities between. Michigan, Ann Arbor, uh, northern New Jersey, where I live now, or Moscow, where <laughs> I spent most of my life. And uh, some, some may compare University of Michigan with uh, Mosco Moscow State University, which, uh, I mean, as I kind of said, I graduated from its law school 20, 21 years ago. Um, well, in uh, maybe weather and some pieces of architecture, the universities are similar, but if you go there for study, you'll be disappointed. Um, but I'm not here to talk about the schools, of course. So let me start uh, from sort of history, short history excursus. Um, Russian perestroika and the collapse of Soviet Union is already history. It happened more than 20 years ago. Um, and that was a peaceful revolution in the Soviet Union when after 70 years of uh, uh, communist experiments, um, this extractive and inhuman uh, Soviet regime unexpectedly died. Uh, and left the huge space, the largest country in the world by territory, uh, for for the new beginnings. So that was more than 20 years ago. Some people count 25. It depends which you take as a starting uh, moment. <clears throat> uh, human rights in the Soviet Union was something tricky. Uh, there was Soviet constitution, so some core human rights were, of course, declared by that constitution. But this was almost totally absent in the real life. And um, Soviet propaganda was talking a lot about human rights, but when this was about a protest somewhere in the United States, uh, and I remember um, when I was a, really a school boy um, in the mid-80s, there was a, a protester in Washington, D.C., Dr. Hyder. Um, I don't believe any of you, I mean, some of you may remember, but not many. Uh, but for us in, in Russia, in Moscow, he was a man of the news because propaganda was talking about him, about his hunger strike which lasts for a year, something unusual, I think. 
Um, but that was a talk on Russian on Soviet television for a year. So everyone, every household knew who is, who was Dr. Haider. And funny enough, uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky uh, started to be in business at about the same time. Uh, he was young and then the young businessman uh, at that time. And he had that, uh, because his name sounds a little bit similar to Haider, so friends were calling him Haider. That was his nickname given, given by the friends. Of course, many forget about it, but you can see how this strangely impact uh, us at that time. So, <clears throat> following the perestroika uh, in the beginning of the 90s, uh, there was a rapid progress in giving human rights to Russians. Uh, and it was not only declarations, like, you know, new constitution. There were real changes, for example, changes to the criminal court, which I was, as, as a student at that time, I was, like, you know, watching life. So, for example, in the Russian criminal code, so the, 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 the code, which I don't know, you probably have the same, right, in, in, in Michigan. Um, uh, in the Soviet Russian criminal code, there was a crime of speculation. Speculation meant that you purchase for less and sell with profit. That was a crime in the Soviets, in the Soviet time. The other crime was uh, private entrepreneurship. So to, to have a private business was a crime because all business is supposed to be run by state. So if you're in private business, you are a criminal. Um, there was also an article in the criminal court prohibiting uh, sexual relations between men. That was a crime. Uh, all these three and many other um, articles of the criminal code, which was inheritance, uh, inheritance from, from the Soviet times, they were uh, canceled, terminated, so they disappear as a crimes in the beginning of 90s as a result of, of all this perestroika process. Um, so, and of course, there were many other changes, many other new laws, and uh, uh, at least on paper, Russia became a democracy. Unfortunately, the wheels of history, as it usually happens, started to run back, uh, to roll back. Um, when it started, it's hard to say. My opinion, to my opinion, uh, the beginning was the big mistake done by first Russian president, Boris Yeltsin, when he, uh, instead of having a free elections, he decided to appoint his uh, successor, Vladimir Putin, to be the president um, and to run the country. Uh, of course, Putin potentially could be a Democrat and he could follow perestroika line. But he is, and he, now we know, he is not. Um, and, uh, well, we can blame Boris Yeltsin for not, you know, thinking about it, because, you know, if we have pre-elections, it would be different, but now we have Putin, who is clearly a product of the communist system and of the elite school of that system, which is KGB. Um, Plus, he is a product of the dirty and criminal streets of uh, Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. That was his childhood, and, and uh, that's also when the other side of him. Uh, so the use of brutal force, the rule by force, for Putin is quite natural. Uh, and on the other side of him, Human rights, the whole concept of human rights, is something foreign for Mr. Putin. That's the, that's something, I mean, human rights, that's for Americans. 
in his mind. Um, so, even if under the law in the beginning of 2000, say in the, th in the year 2003, uh, the uh, rights of the right of private uh, business to make profit, to be profitable, and to trade freely, this was a law, this was acceptable, this was uh, protected by the laws. However, for Putin, with his background, and for his law enforcement, uh, or so-called siloviki, you probably heard this term, uh, it became quite universal now. So these siloviki, they are the product of the same system as Putin. So shall, let, let's not sort of say Putin is something and the people around him are different. The people who support him, who work for him in, in, in the Russian state are, you know, with the same background. So they are similar to him. Um, so for them, as the product of the Soviet system, the private entrepreneurship, what it is, it is speculation. It is a crime. Um, and now let me switch to the Yukas case example. We, I don't know who, to what extent you're familiar with that one, but I was obviously, I am a part of that story, so uh, I know it well. So it's easy for me to come up with that example. Um, first reason for the attack on Yukas and Horakovsky, of course, a political one. Uh, Putin wanted to destroy a powerful opponent, political opponent, who was Horakovsky. You know, it's it's uh, it's been known for, I mean, well known to every uh, everyone interested in politics that uh, Horakovsky was supporting oppositional parties. Is this a crime in a democracy to financially support uh, an oppositional party? Of course not. For Putin, fortunately, he had a, a different view. Uh, and of course, his Siloviki were looking for a tool how to legitimize their case against Horakovsky. And they quite quickly found a one, uh, the, this legi legitimization, uh, because Yukas was purchasing oil from its production subsidiaries and purchasing this uh, oil for a lesser price than Yukos was selling the same oil uh, on the free market, making profit. So here we are, it's speculation. Uh, there is no such an article in the Russian criminal code any longer. Not a big problem. There are plenty of, of articles, hundreds of them in the criminal code, so it's unfortunately usual, usual for a lawless country. We need a person and we will find a, an article for him. Just give us a person. Uh, so this uh, profitable business of Yucca Soil Company was uh, found embezzlement. Uh, and that was the charge against Horikovsky and many others, including myself, that we embezzled oil by way of purchasing for less and selling for selling with profit. And of course, the famous money laundering was, as usual, added to that crime because it gives a much more severe punishment under the criminal court and because it sells better to the West. Everyone fights with money laundering, so who knows what happened, but it's a talk. It's a brand. <laughs> and uh, very soon after these charges was brought against Horakovsky and, and his managers, um, 
the the same you know tools and instruments in the hands of Siloviki was turned against uh, Yuka's lawyers, those who defend the company or its managers. It's uh, fortunately quite obvious why it happened because we are immediate opposition uh, to the prosecution. We we interact with them, uh, so lawyers in house and outside of the company was the immediate and visible target for the uh, prosecutor's uh, attack. And of course, uh, this at that time was needed not only to punish, but also there was a growing interest, in business interest or from people close to Putin to grab the business. So that is the other main reason of the uh, attack and, 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 and uh, bankruptcy of the Yucas oil company. Simply uh, people, and then first of all, Rosneft wanted to take over this profitable business. And here's, here, here were the lawyers who were trying to protect Yucas, who were quite, sometimes quite effectively was uh, filing papers and arguing. So at least it was a problem for uh, law enforcement and for uh, Rosneft behind them uh, on their way. So they brought the cases against, uh, they brought charges against the lawyers. And uh, most known of these uh, cases was again Svetlana Bachmina and Vasily Alexanian. Uh, my case followed, there are other cases and then other uh, people like like Yelena Granovska and uh, uh, Dmitry Gololov who, who escaped the, the, the much suffering. Uh, it's uncomparable for what happened with uh, Bachmina and uh, Alexanian. Uh, but still, you know, it's it's not. These are just known cases. But there were a lot of lawyers who left at the time, uh, and then at least suffered uh, problems with you know professionally. These are all quite sad stories, especially for me, because I knew all of them, I still know them, uh, personally, and um, it's it's hard uh, what happened with them, especially with my good friend Vasily Alexanian, who died. Um, now, what where we are, 10 years left since all this happening, I mean, most of this uh, events dated back in 2003, 2004. And uh, thanks to, I can say this, thanks to Putin, Kharkovsky is free now. He's a free man, he is outside of the country, and uh, I'm uh, one lucky enough to talk to him. I, I was able to talk to him just last week. Um, one of the, uh, his first projects he is going to run and he, he articulated that that he's going to do this uh, that would be uh, a run for the protection of the rights of prisoners and political prisoners in Russia um, and uh, first of all as you know if we're talking about Yukas at this day only one person remains in jail uh, out of uh, the others were released. Uh, so for Horikovsky, of course, his former employee uh, is an important person, but it's, 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 he's not talking about protecting only one person. He's talking about the political prisoners like those arrested after the Balotnesk way events. Uh, and the other prisoners who are really suffering, there's a lot, for example, there's a lot of business people who are you know, staying in Russian jails because of the some business conflicts or the, the, the use of law enforcement against uh, uh, competitors. Or simply because you, you're better connected to the state and can grab somebody's business uh, or property and then put the, your enemy in jail. So this is what, what Kharkovsky is, is planning to do. And... Uh, uh, people in jails are, of course, those who are most, who, who are suffering the most. Uh, but 
it's not just you know serious violations of human rights in the prisons in Russia. The situation in the whole country is degrading uh, in, in, the, in that term. Let's take uh, Sochi example. In Sochi, which is in Russia, in a country where the freedom of movement is in the constitution. So it's, it's, it, Russians can move freely around the country and stay and be where they want to without permission. Sochi is, is uh, quite different these days. You need a permit to enter Sochi sports events. Uh, it's so-called sports fans passport, which every you know, fan should have to just to attend the, the, the sport event. And uh, there, there are cases being reported where uh, activists and some oppositional journalists were not given this uh, passport, so they cannot go there. Like uh, Ilya Yashin was, was uh, rejected and cannot be there. Um, the other problem is uh, uh, connected with the uh, enforcement of the decisions, the judgment of the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, you might heard about that court. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a highest instance, uh, highest uh, uh, court ist instance for uh, all European countries uh, to consider the disputes between citizens of European countries and their governments on the human rights issues. So it's, it's, it's considered the cases based on the European Convention on the Human Rights. And uh, uh, there are thousands of uh, cases being filed by Russian citizens against Russian Federation with that court. Uh, and of course there are decisions which were made by that court in favor of, of, of Russian citizens, so in, in protection of their, of their, their various human rights. But the, uh, there are difficulties with the enforcement of this judgment. Uh, quite recently, Russian Supreme Court, the highest Russian court, ignored to adopt uh, ACHR ruling uh, that the Half billion dollar, uh, so-called civil claim uh, from Russian tax authorities against Kharkovsky and Lebedev was in fact a violation of the human rights of these two gentlemen under the I mean the human rights under the European Convention. And Russia obviously is a party. So what the Supreme Court of Russian Federation did, they just ignored the direct, basically, decision and, and, and instruction, if, if I may put it that way, of the European Court of Human Rights to the, what, what to do and, and cancel that uh, civil claim. That was ignored. And uh, uh, this is not the only example. Like, like Pichugin, the, the only prisoner of Yukos who stays in jail so far, I mean, at this moment, sorry. Um, Again, European Court of Human Rights ruled that uh, he, his, uh, uh, his trial uh, had substantial and serious violations of his rights. So basically, this is the prescription to retry his case against Supreme Court of Russian Federation, ignored that uh, ruling. So who knows what will be next, but... European Court of Human Rights and the uh, Council of Europe is facing a serious difficulty now because uh, there is a UCAS monetary claim pending and it is to be considered and, uh, and ruled pretty soon. And we're talking at least about $2 billion of uh, monetary compensation to be paid to, to UCAS oil or to you know, foreign remains of that company. Uh, and I'm sure that, that the judges of the European Court of Human Rights are very much hesitant to make this ruling because 
Russian Federation can sort of get mad and say, if you rule that way, we are out of Council of Europe. We are not to be governed by, by this uh, uh, international organization because we don't want to pay this money. So it's, uh, uh, I, I think that, that, that the European Court of Human Rights is sort of looking for a compromise because they want to protect uh, those suffering the most and whom they can protect in Russia. I'm talking about the Chechen's families whose uh, uh, relatives were killed or tortured. And, uh, and, and as we know, uh, European Court of Human Rights many times by, by now uh, judged uh, in their favor and then at least Russian Federation paid the uh, monetary compensation to this family. If Russia is out of Council of Europe because they dissatisfied with these rulings, even these, you know, personal compensations are not to be uh, given. Uh, so I believe that that uh, European Court of Human Rights can make sort of a political decision and not satisfy Yukos oil claims against Russia simply because you know to keep the option to protect. Uh, uh, ordinary people in Russia I against much more serious violation of their lives, the, the, their human rights, because we're talking about lives. Um, so, as we can see now in, in, in that deteriorate, deteriorating situation in Russia, in all, in many aspects, not only human rights, uh, what can be the tools, what, what can the international community and foreign countries, what can they do with this situation? And, you know, it's, it, there's no much things which can be done by, in, in reality, by, by foreign governments with uh, a regime, a government which violates the human rights of the, its own people. Sanctions is one of the things which historically been used, uh, but sanctions, old-fashioned and usually usual sanctions which were applied were normally uh, the trading sanctions. And with Russia and in, in, in the modern world, this is not probably what will work. Uh, so I think that what uh, happened here in the United States a year ago when the U.S. Congress pioneered with uh, and been creative with introducing a new type of sanctions. And I'm talking now about the Magnitsky Act, or it's, it's like a, the full name of this act is Sergei Magnitsky Rule of Law Accountability Act of 2012, because it was adopted in December 2012. Um, these are the sanctions which are not targeting international trade, export and import, but specific human rights abusers in Russia. So, uh, according to this act, which was signed in, in the law by President Obama a little bit more than a year ago, uh, the president shall introduce a list of these violators, and of course it, it has to be State Department who uh, prepare this list for the president, and people who violated, uh, who, who are gross violators, that, that's the word used in the law, uh, of the human rights in Russia has to be included, so they are banned from entering the United States and, and the assets in the U.S. has to be frozen. So far, uh, only 18 persons were named in this act, in, 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 in the list which was signed, executed by, by the president. Not many. And these uh, um, investigators and prosecutors and judges responsible for the death of uh, Sergei Magnitsky himself, who was fighting, as, as I hope you know, who was fighting against the corruption. I mean, who discovered a big crime of corruption, and then for that he suffered and died in jail. So uh, that was a good beginning back in April of last year. 
unfortunately uh, the uh, extension, the additions to the list which was due to be uh, issued uh, by Obama in December this year, uh, at the very last moment our president cut this off. So no n new name was added in spite of the, that the draft was prepared for him by the State Department. Uh, why President Obama is hesitant to do this you know, it's still a big question. And uh, uh, for me, you know, I participated in this process of sort of lobbying of, for, for the Magnitsky Act and that we weren't the, uh, these human rights violators to be in that list. And, and, and we are thinking about those violators who uh, harmed people uh, within the frame of the Yukos case. So it's all been put on the stop. And... Uh, uh, thanks to the uh, smart uh, legislators, uh, there is a route, there is an avenue how the uh, names to be added to the list can be introduced, uh, and at least the president administration is to be publicly asked to do this, and if they don't want to do this, they should motivate why they don't. So uh, recently in January, uh, when the um, congressman learned that, that Obama doesn't want to put new names into the list, um, the uh, chairman of the F Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Menendez of New Jersey, uh, introduced two names. One of these names uh, is the chief uh, investigator of the Russian Federation. So it's quite a top official, Mr. Bastrykin, known to be very brutal and, 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 and uh, being behind many political investigations uh, running, uh, going on in Russia now. So his name is now offered to President Obama to be considered as, a, as an addition to the Magnitsky or Magnitsky Act list. Uh, the President administration has 120 days to respond, so we'll see. But this is a good option, not an easy one, uh, but it's a good. It's a, at least it's an option to uh, argue to the U.S. government, please, not just because they, as we go back in time, just for one year, uh, U.S. administration was very reluctant to adopt this law, the Magnitsky Act. And it took this almost anonymous uh, agreement of the congressman, as was vast majority of uh, uh, of the House who voted uh, for that law, and 94 senators, U.S. senators, who voted for uh, Magnitsky Act. So, in spite of the resistance from White House and State Department, this law was adopted. So now let it work. Uh, this is what we are asking the, the, the government to do. And uh, here let me sort of conclude that uh, if you have some intention to help uh, the, 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 the protection of human rights in Russia and to uh, punish or at least name and shame those violators of human rights, please work with your congressman. Ask your members of the House of Representatives, if you ask your senators to, and offer them the names. And uh, on the internet, through myself, you can find the good candidates to be included into the list. Let's do that. Um, and let me conclude here. I'm happy to answer your questions. And thank you for your attention. Human rights are like foreign to uh, Vladimir Putin, who is the president of Russia. Uh, but what about under Yeltsin, with the shelling of the parliament in 1993 and the first Chechen war? Mm -hmm. Are we, aren't these like human rights violations? Or? Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, the, the, the simple and general answer, yes, of course, that was wrong. What was, uh, I mean, 
it was no, it's, it, I cannot even say it was unnecessary. If, if, uh, but Yeltsin is the product of the same system. He was much more human as a person, and 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 he he wanted the the progress and the 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 way towards democracy in 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 Russia. So that's why he was personally popular. But he did a lot of mistakes, and the appointment of his successor, and uh, sort of rejection of free election in the country. And that happened with Yeltsin himself, because in the 96, uh, it's hard to call those election free. If it would be free, he would probably lose. And at that time, you know, it, it was hard to understand for many. But now we can say these were mistakes, these were wrong. Bruce, please. You're a good candidate for us. I mean, you've got candidates who should be nominated to be on the Magnitsky list. Do you have a congressman that you would suggest that we try to move? Um, there aren't very many. Uh, well, uh, target, first of all, those who are the members of the uh, Foreign Relations or Foreign Affairs Committees, because the way how it works under the Magnitsky Act, if you're interested to know this, it's not nothing uh, tricky. Uh, the five committees of the House and five committees of the Senate can introduce these names, and the this public introduction of the name has to be signed by both the chairman and the ranking member. So it's it's not that simple to get this, but if uh, if your congressman is a prominent member of one of the committees who can who or say a chairman or a ranking member, well, that's the way. And and and, and uh, you know, being your fellow American, I know how it works. It works. It's not easy, but uh, sometimes you know these people have their hearts and then they they're interested and. There can be some connections with Russia. It happened. Like when we, when the process of lobbying happening, uh, we were surprised uh, some, uh, in, in, in many instances how some congressman, uh, you know, know the country, has a connection. There are no uh, congressmen in, the, in today's Congress who has any connection to Russia. It's a fact. But uh, you never know. <laughs> So some of them really were really helpful, and I'm sure they will be. Sure. Please. Well, Yukos was first of all the biggest one, uh, the, the 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 most you know the, the, the well-growing big oil company. Um, so to make it an example was. Probably, you know, you can make the best example by, by by attacking your most powerful enemy. That was probably what in mind of of, of Putin and Sechin. Uh, also, you know, Horikovsky and Group Manitab were not just. I mean, all of the big businessmen were active in politics one way or the other. However, those people were most visible. They did a lot of things. They were really building uh, a substantial group of supporters within the uh, Russian Duma. And they were already known to be in fact effective in the previous Duma elected in 99 uh, in what they I mean, in effectively lobbying for the laws they wanted and, and you know, cutting off some other pieces of legislation. So the, this was already an influential group and absolutely independent from the government because they have enormous resources, you know, good profits from their oil business. So the, 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 the and, and also Kharkovsky was not uh, ready. He, 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 again, he publicly w was saying, yes, w I'm doing what I want. I'm a powerful oligarch supporting opposition in the country. For for Putin, for Kremlin, it was something he could not tolerate. 
No, I'm just no, no. It's not. It's nothing wrong with human rights for Russians, and Russians were, were pretty happy to have you know more freedoms, to have freedom of movement, to have uh, f- you know free entrepreneurship, to, to to have their property better protected. It's so all was welcomed. It's natural for 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 Russians. It's just you know the conceptually from their education, they. They don't know exactly what it is. Uh, so for them, as I said, it's something foreign in terms they just don't know. They heard about human rights, uh, thinking about uh, Dr. Heider. I mean, it's a joke, of course, but but they, uh, it is something which uh, uh, Soviet education simply did not submit that and didn't pre- didn't give them that piece of education they didn't know and uh, uh, in the 90s and nowadays it, it's still you know something well they, they have a li- they probably have better knowledge of what it is but still it's it's a long way to go and if you compare with the uh, with with how you, you've been taught from your elementary schools what human rights are this thing is not to say absent, but very minimal in Russia compared to what you have in the U.S. So it's 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 a it, this is for the, at the end of the day. This is for the government to let the, the 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 education to move in that direction, and of course in Russia today, government is not interested. I can only hope that it will not be bloody um, and many people in, in Russia many Russians can sort of disagree with me including Horikovsky but I think the peaceful way to the end of that regime and that situation in Russia uh, will be um, uh, not the dissolution of Russian Federation, but much more uh, autonomy in the regions, because it's still it's it's you know, what is Russia today? This is what remained from the Russian Empire. So if you look to the map, there was Russian Empire run by the Emperor and Tsars of Russia, and it was built uh, mostly in the 19th century. You know, Alaska was a part of Russian Empire. So it was from uh, Warsaw on the west to Anchorage on the east, or it's west again. <laughs> it was a huge empire. And uh, I would say that in the end of the 19th century, it gradually started to collapse. And there was this uh, famous October Revolution when the empire became much smaller. And then, it, it, after 70 years or so, how many, didn't count, there was perestroika. So the Soviet Union collapsed. And never, you know, empire is getting smaller. And it's still too big. It, if you think that government in Moscow, in a very centralized vertical system of management, which has been built by Putin uh, and his guys, if these people really can manage the Far East, the you know the, the the places, the part of Russia which is I don't know five six thousand miles from Moscow, no, it's unmanageable. And the way how they want to manage it with all this centralization, the all decision making, all budget decision making, budgetary decision making made in Moscow. It cannot work. It, you know, the United States is a big country, but look how much auto- autonomy was given to the states. It's, it's, it's a union. So the way for Russia, the, the, the peaceful resolution for Russia is to become a union of a sort of United States. And this only hopes, who knows how, how and when it's going to happen, but I am definitely in favor of this uh, decentralization, at least, of the country. 
Bruce? The candidate for the next uh, ambassador to Russia from here. Wow. <laughs> we didn't do too well last time. Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, I had, mm, we were meeting with, with Mark Fall when he was assistant to, to, to Obama, and we put any hopes in him. He disappointed us very much when he publicly acted against Magnitsky Act and with many other uh, situations. So it's a good news that he is living. I hope he will be a good professor back in Stanford. Uh, he still wants to be Secretary of State, though. Uh, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> Let him be a professor. <laughs> um, but who would be a good candidate? Well, you know, having this experience, and I'm not a big, I was not a big fan of uh, uh, the previous ambassador. I thought he was too much of a uh, bureaucrat. But today, I mean, after we had the experience with Mark Fall, I would say let it be better an advanced bureaucrat, a good diplomat to serve in that chair, to do the job and not to, you know, appear publicly, not to have some arguments with uh, uh, Kremlin propaganda machine. No, there, there is no help with that. So let, let, let it be a good diplomat that sometimes helps. But I, I don't have, I don't know the US, you know, top diplomacy. I hope there are good candidates. Like, I remember the head of Russia desk, Mary Warlick. She was a very effective head of Russia desk at the State Department, and she is now a uh, consul general in Australia. Who knows? So I'm sure there are still good diplomats in the U.S. State Department. Uh, please. Uh, the views. Well, uh, first of all, uh, the, the this this system, the, the courts in Russia. Uh, they, in the 90s, there were good steps towards the independence, for the judges to decide on the law rather than being under the control uh, of the executive power. So it was a, a move, a process moving the system in the right direction. But this process was quite um, rapidly stopped when Putin came to power. Uh, so Yuka's case is the most, you know, sound, well-known example of, of how the executive power can force justice to do, to, to f not to follow the law, but to follow the, the, the Kremlin interest. So th there are so many examples what what happened in this case. So many violations of Russian laws, and even the, the the pure logic, like in the second case, you know, you cannot embezzle 200 million tons of oil. Just impossible. Um, but this happened, and, and 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 but but unfortunately, this is in the interest of Kremlin, of Putin, of his regime, not to have independent courts but to have judges whom they appoint, whom they control, whom they can remove if they do something not satisfactory to Kremlin. And that system is pretty well built after 13, 14 years of Putin's power. Uh, you know, every judge in Russia is a federal judge, which means it is appointed by the president. Every single judge. There are no ex exceptions. Um, of course, president cannot do it on his own, so he has a department in Kremlin full of former KGB officials, generally led by, by you know, colonels or, or, or generals of KGB, uh, who check the candidates and uh, talk to them and tell them what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to judge. Uh, this is the system as you know been, been, been reported in, 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 in the Russian oppositional independent media how it works but this is this is the the, 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 the very wrong court system which I mean this is another uh, 
site of this so-called Russian democracy, which is not a democracy at all. Yes, please. You expect, you expect the empire to keep disintegrating. Do you think the Chinese will facilitate that in the Far East? Um, mm, not by force. I don't believe that no. China... I don't believe that Chinese will do that. It, they they facilitate it like like they they are already facilitating that process because there are so many of them, and there is a huge and uh, very rural and not not unpopular that not not many people live in Russia, especially in those areas. So it's a natural process, which is seen already how Chinese. Uh, penetrate the country, and I see nothing wrong in that. It's, 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 it's normal. <laughs> there are people, they need space, uh, and there is a, an empty space, so why not? And, and it's, it's already, I remember just an, an example from, again, Yuka's lawyer's side, uh, when Harakovsky was in, in, in the camp in uh, Krasnokamensk. Krasnokamensk is that part of Russia which is not too far from China. So I was, you know, my friends who, who had traveled there, the, the Horkovsky lawyers, because it's so remote, it's like you take more than uh, 24 hours to get there from Moscow. So they uh, stayed there for an extended time. So they sometimes have, you know, weekends or public holidays there. So where did they go to have some rest, have a break. They go to China. They go to Manchuria, which is the much more developed land. Cities, you know, with facilities, shops, uh, nice saunas. They really enjoy this hospitality given to them by Chinese. So, and that's the place, the, the nearest place to Krasnokamensk where people go and have, you know, short breaks. So, it is it's a demographical process. We cannot fight with that. And um, to oppose that means, you know, you can't, it, these are natural forces. And uh, again, because the country is so much centralized, the look, the, you know, how they see it from Moscow, it's not the real, you know, understanding of what's going on in these regions. So they, of course, they can uh, send more military to protect the borders, but you know, if it just it's if it's it's a border control, border lines, and military protecting what the empty land. So it's it has to be full of people to develop. Please. Yeah. Um, so as I understand it, uh, the legislature is really the only uh, the only. Uh, branch of the government that can over, uh, over, uh, overpower presidential decrees um, and thus overpower some of, some of what Putin has done. Um, so the legislature is currently controlled basically in both houses by the, the United Russia Party, which is Putin's own party. Are there any, are there any dissidents within the United Russia Party uh, uh, who, would, who would possibly uh, challenge Putin uh, and Towards a more, more move towards a more democratic uh, agenda, and if not, are there any other parties? I know the I know the Duma used to be controlled two thirds by the United Russia Party, and now uh, has less than two thirds. Um, is there any chance for a, for a, for a different party to steal more seats? Um, you know what what I would say is you should not use the political model you see in the US or in Western Europe for, for Russia, you know, to, to, to analyze what was going on there. Because here you have huge, you know, political parties, the history of what they're doing and, and how they compete. So in Russia, United Russia or its predecessors with different names, or what will replace United Russia, because United Russia is, is losing popular, so there's now this uh, People's Front created to sort of, a way to substitute United Russia, because United Russia is not popular. You know, this is the, 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 the parties set up by the government. 
it was in the past. I mean, when it was Soviet Union, there was, was only one party because they didn't want more. They could have more potentially, but, but there was no need. They killed them all. Um, and, and, and nowadays they do the same. So there is a, there's Kremlin and, 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 and these party leaders, they're just puppets in their hands. It's, it's, it's what they do is, is just follow directions from Kremlin. And uh, if you compare the quality of these public servants or Kremlin servants, I mean, you would see that, that, that those who are really not very well performing in, in terms of state management, they go and became people's, I mean, whatever they call the deputies of, of Russian Duma or, or senators, because they, they, they not much depends on what they do. They simply stamp the laws sent to them from Kremlin or from, from uh, the government. Uh, and those things they, they mm, invent on their own, they, their own legislative initiatives uh, most of them are just crazy, even for you know the Kremlin's point of view. It's, it's, it's ridiculous what they're trying to do, but 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 still, you know, the, the nowadays these people are. I mean, they cannot be popular among voters because what they do is 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 out of it's insane sometimes, like this uh, uh, anti-adoption law. I mean, as a response to, to, to Magnitsky Act, they, they punished the poor, you know, orphans in Russia. How it can be? They, they're just ridiculous. So what I would expect is going to happen, because, because clearly United Russia is losing popularity, they're going to find a substitute. And they, I saw just recent news that they started to, to, to build this United People's Front, uh, which uh, to me very much a reminder of the Communist Party. So they're going to have that front because the word party, the, 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 the word is not popular. So people are, yeah, full enough of this terminology. So the, the Kremlin is trying to find a new terminology to, to have something more popular. But they are a problem. They, they will not allow really free and competi competent uh, competi you know, competition in the elections. And uh, they have like another two, three years before the next round, three years, or even four. Uh, but they started, I mean, Kremlin started already to prepare the, the ground and uh, the new law, the changes into the law was adopted. But it's not promising at all. So uh, I wouldn't expect uh, I wouldn't expect this uh, softening of the regime. I, unfortunately, it can go quite opposite. Hopefully not. Hopefully not to uh, something which reminds Stalinist times and what Stalin did with the country. Not that brutal. Um, but still, yeah, we'll see. After the, everyone is now waiting the end of Olympics and what will be the next steps uh, directed by Putin and implemented by his Siloviki, who are, you know, it's easy to say they are much worse than even than Putin. Some of them. Um, please, what do you mean? Two presidents, first and the last. <laughs> Um, well, we, we, we had Medvedev, <laughs> so there's a third one. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he was he a was, uh, uh, sea-warming president for Putin. Uh, well, uh, you know, if you look into the Russian history, there were no presidents, there were only tsars and then dictators and leaders, communist leaders. Uh, so basically, the, 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 the first and only elected president is, is Yeltsin. And he was only elected one time. Yes, Bruce, it was, was, was when he was in, elected the Russia president in 91. Uh, 
That's it. Because in 96, I cannot say that was really a free and normal election. More or less better than the, the last election of Putin, but still. So, so far we had only one publicly elected and, and really uh, real, pre really elected president. Uh, yes, it was still the Soviet Union, even if it was, you know, a very much collapsed or collapsing Soviet Union. Um, well, I, I, I definitely hope that, that we will have more, in, even in my lifetime, there will be more presidents of Russia. Uh, the bigger question is whether it will be the same size Russian Federation or not, not a much smaller Russia. Which is good enough, you know. <laughs> it's still, I mean, it's, the country is too be too big to be uh, centralized that way. It's just not a modern way of running any country. Yes. Uh -huh. hmm. That was a good question. The, the 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 situation is is Ukraine, as far as I have learned today, I had not much time to 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 to, to read. But it's another wave in Kiev, a wave of violence, actually. Um, so people in the streets in Kiev and in, in, in the Western Ukraine and Central Ukraine uh, now seems to be prepared for violence against the governmental forces. And uh, uh, as far as I know, Ukrainian military is not to fight with its own people, so we are talking about some special forces like Berkut, uh, who might be powerful enough to destroy this whole wave, but maybe not. It's really, it's a, it's a fight now in the streets of Kiev. Uh, Putin's role in, in that is, of course, very much pro Yanukovych. You know, Yanukovych is his, his guy, even if they are not big friends and not to be, very close. You just, you know, t these are two authoritarian leaders who are very similar by nature, but who would probably more likely hate each other than be friends. And the Yanukovych, for sure, doesn't want to be uh, uh, Putin's puppet, pu Putin's, you know, nominee. He, he seems to be uh, in a situation where to follow the the directions from Kremlin is his only chance to survive. And of course, he wants to remain uh, the president of Ukraine because otherwise he will be in jail on the next day. Or he, he needs to run outside of the country. And then, as I said a, couple, a week ago, when I was talking in NYU, that uh, the peaceful solution for the Ukraine and the good and the best solution for both the Ukrainian people and for Yanukovych, if Yanukovych run and live in Sochi. It's a nice place for him to be. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, like the, the former Kyrgyzstan president, probably, where he lives, I guess in Moscow or somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, 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 it's quite a, you know, a good scenario for this... Uh, authoritarian and then really not good bad leaders for, for, for the former Soviet Union countries. So Yanukovych belonged to that side. So I very much hope that, that uh, um, Yanukovych will make this choose choice himself and run. That's his option. Uh, because otherwise, you know, there's going to be a big fight and obviously again, Putin is not I don't believe he is crazy that much as he will force, you know, if he use Russian military in the Ukraine. They do use secret services. They, 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 there were uh, facts about this in, in, in the media. Uh, but to, you know, use the, the, the regular Russian army in eastern Ukraine, that, that's something... I believe is, is is outrageous. It's not going to happen, and not just because Putin is is is, is a, as I said before, Putin is quite brutal. He is, is it would be normal for him with his background to use force, and they did it against 
Georgia. Uh, but uh, he understands two things quite clearly. First, that Russian military is disorganized and not really ready for a serious operation. And Georgian conflict, the Georgian you know, attack and, and, and uh, uh, tank expedition to Georgia was a you know, good showing for Putin that, that his, his military is not really ready for, for operation. Um, that's one thing. The other thing, I really don't expect uh, Russian people you know, serving in the military to fight with Ukrainians. That would be a you know brother against brother war. Remember that you know the, 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 the two countries are so much historically close, and and and, and the families. I would expect every third, every fourth Russian family have Ukrainian relatives. There's been centuries of, of, you know, life together. So it, it would be, it's not going to happen that, that the Russians will fight Ukrainians on the Ukrainian territory. No, forget about it. So Putin probably understand this. So he will use what he can. He will use, he will use money. He's already using money to, to bribe. Uh, Yanukovych and his government and through them Ukrainian people which is clearly doesn't work Ukrainian people doesn't bite it and I, I understood that this last two days wave of violence in Kiev being triggered by this uh, second tranche of Russian money promised uh, by Russian uh, finance minister it's just a trigger you know people in the Ukraine as I see them they, they're prepared to fight with the government, fight with force. Uh, so it's not a peaceful demonstration any longer. Um, so the point, what will be a trigger for them to start fighting? Well, perhaps even that very remote thing as, as, as the promise of an avatranche of the loan. Um, so I don't know what, what what will save Yanukovych regime is probably a, a miracle. I don't know what, what he, he he needs to resign. I mean, he can delay that, say, say you know, like the, the promise people the, the 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 free elections of the president and uh, Rada, uh, say in half a year or in a year, that potentially can. <laughs> Specify the, the, the situation, but even that cannot be <laughs> may, maybe will not be enough uh, as as the situation develops now. We'll, we'll see. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. <laughs>